hit the button. HTB. It is midnight somewhere. Stream team. I just hit the button. It is midnight somewhere. Now, last time it was 4 a.m., now it's 5 a.m. That's even further west than the middle of the sea. Out west of Alaska. Now we're like two hours west of Alaska. Where are we? Who knows geography? Somebody, I, I, there's a, I, it's a flat earth, right? So I think you fall off after that, right? I keep hearing about the flat earthers. What, what's going on with them? Maybe they're right. I, I don't think so, but good Lord, why are they so passionate about it? It doesn't seem like you could be that delusional, right? I don't know. That's a weird one. Flat earthers. I don't even think they thought that back in the old days. How I mean, come on. How do we know they thought the earth was flat? Do we know that? I mean, come on. Everything looks round. They're looking out at the sun and the moon. They all look, they figure out they're round, right? They're like marbles. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't buy this. Yeah, everybody thought the world was flat. Maybe a few people did. <laughs> Just like a few people do now, but I don't know. Well, this was unplanned. Uh, it's once again going on my uh, webcam. Today's uh, six. No, it's yeah, it's June. It's the eighth of June, twenty twenty-two, five a.m. Central Daylight Savings Time. It's good to get, good to have your bearings. Um, Things, things are synchronized. Things fall into place. I stopped rushing. I go slowly. What? What? I'm in a hurry and don't know why. Who did that country song? That's a fun one. I'm in a hurry and don't know why. I rush and rush until life's no fun. All I gotta really do is live and die. And life's no dumb. I don't know. If, if you don't know the lyrics, just beg it. <laughs> I can feel the lyrics. I haven't heard that in 10 years. Oh, I had fun with that one. My buddy, my former best friend, was staying with me. He's a madman. He was always dashing. Always multitasking. Get stuff done. Got to get stuff done. Got to get stuff done. But why? It needs to be done. Why? Because I want it done. Why? Because I do. All right. Good enough for me. <laughs> you don't look very happy, but <laughs> it's important to get stuff done. Go get it done. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you look like a miserable wreck. <laughs> it looks like you're, you're, pausing. you're not pausing to smell a few flowers. You know what I mean? I feel... I feel the primary purpose of life is deep, rich, meaningful experiences. Not rushing. Maybe that is. But not everything. What would I run? My wife's about to have a baby. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'll be rushing. I'm sure I'll be rushing. I think it's probably important. I probably wouldn't call the ambulance, man. I can drive as fast as the ambulance driver. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, how, how do you stop? We need some cops. Cops, what do we do? We got to get our wife to the, uh, you got it all set up. You know, you know where you're supposed to go. And I don't know, I have had a baby for 30, 33 years. How's it worked now? 34 years ago. <laughs> Back then, I had, how did we do it? Dead government. We lived, we lived real close to the, it was a real cool place in Las Vegas. My wife and I, Wilhelmina, were living in a little condo. I was making a living as a blackjack card counter. <laughs> it's not illegal, you know. It's not illegal. It's very difficult. I don't recommend it as a as a vocation. It's fun to play around with as a hobby. In fact, 
I have not played blackjack in so long. The fun thing about blackjack is it's not a random game of chance. You, uh, you can push the odds not totally in your favor, but you can get the game down to pretty much a break-even game for the most part without, without counting cards, all right? Forget about the counting cards. That, that's not important. You don't need to count, count cards. You're not counting cards. What you're doing is you're keeping track of how many aces and tens are in the deck compared to the little cards. Because you want a deck that's full of aces and tens. Huh? Imagine that. So all you're doing, you use a little system. You use a little system of keeping track of the big cards and the little cards. It's that simple. It's not, you know, Rain Man. That's, that's fun, but the blackjack stuff in there is so fantasy. That's not the real blackjack world. We got any real blackjack players out there. You guys know this. There's a thing called statistical fluctuation. It's the worst thing that all will happen to you as a, as a blackjack player. Good God, you can go on some tears, both good and bad. Statistically unusual tears. Streaks. That's why the Martingale system won't work. You know what the Martingale is? That's where you double up your bet every time you lose. How could that fail? All right, you bet a dollar, you lose. You bet two dollars, you lose. You bet four dollars, you lose. You bet eight dollars, you lose. You bet 16, you lose. 32, you lose. 64, you lose. 128, you lose. 256, you lose. How could that go wrong? Give it a try, you'll see. <laughs> you'll, you'll bankrupt yourself. There'll be a streak where you lose 10 times in a row and your whole bank, your whole bank account will be gone. It'll happen. That's just, that's the funny world of statistics. All right. Uh. All right, I want to feel you guys. I want to feel you guys. Where are you coming from tonight? I don't, I don't need to be live. I don't need to be live. It's getting hot. I got. I got AC. I'm just calling AC. It's going pretty strong. I keep it my. Especially when I'm, when I'm yammering. I tend to heat up a lot when I'm yammering at you guys. These are not hot studio lights. This is just a little GoPro light. I bought the GoPro package. Get their stuff. God, it's good quality stuff. I still haven't used it, but I know it's good. You can just tell. You can tell by the way it's built. Get, get good quality stuff. My, get a nice fragrance. My friend gave me this. God, it smells classy. Got this classy magnetic bottle on it. it smells good. Oh, God, it smells good. I, you know, do something like that. Guys. That's a big deal to women. I don't give a crap about smell, really, but I, I think women's sense of smell is about five or ten times more impactful. I don't know if it's stronger, but smell is an incredibly, I don't like the word smell, what is it? Uh, scent. Scent is a big deal for women. Women, you know, a woman walks into your home and it smells strange. It's very off-putting. So, learn the tricks from the ladies. Use all these, these scent things that the ladies use. Make your home pleasing. I'm very proud of my apartment right now. It went from a pure 500 beer can littered shithole to a very... That was only uh, back in November. That wasn't that long ago. And my best friend, I went down to the lo Looney Farm for a week get myself straightened out. It had something to do with alcohol, but it had more to do with uh, bad thinking habits. I was thinking bad. Yeah, I was thinking bad. I was thinking, I was thinking, thinking I was a bad person. I was thinking life is ruined forever. I was thinking everything in life is, is meaningless. There's no point to it all. I don't have the energy to kill myself, but I, th I just want to Lay around and be drunk all the time. That makes it tolerable. But then it, then it wasn't. Well, <laughs> you know what happened? <laughs> I probably could have kept doing that. Uh, Savage. I, I keep giving it the wrong name. Hey, people ask me what it was, and I, I would say the wrong name. I've seen uh, Savage. What was I saying? I can't remember. Dior. 
He's a, he's a fancy pants. I don't know anything about him. I hear about the, you know, this Michael Kors guy. Who is he? MK. I'm wearing my MKs. <laughs> it's high it's high end. I think it's status stuff, right? But I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's good to have status stuff. <laughs> of course. Then then the <laughs> then the entrepreneurs start knocking it all off, right? So you got all this fake <laughs> MK stuff floating around. <laughs> Can anybody tell the difference? I don't know. <laughs> It's a funny thing, luxury goods. Now, I can't imagine somebody. You can't do a knockoff Mercedes and knockoff Beamer, can you? <laughs> no, you can't. Why not? I don't know. It's too complicated. <laughs> now, a handbag. I guess handbags are, you know, a Gucci handbag. Why is that? Why is that such a big deal? I want to carry one. <laughs> Just to be funny, I want to carry a purse. <laughs> I want to carry a Gucci purse. Oh, I bet the gay guys do, right? You gay guys, you do it? I'm not gay, but <laughs> I like people to think I am. It's funny. The gay guys love me. God, they're funny. Not the, not the stereotype people, but gay guys are, gay guys are who, generally? The softies, you know, the soft ones? Well, you got your macho stud gay guys. Who cares? Leave it alone. Macho stud guy. That was a great All in the Family show. Archie had problems with it with a gay guy or something. It was probably 1975. God, it was cutting edge social commentary on network TV. CBS was scared to death to run this, but I guess uh, Norman Lear had enough clout down there. They, oh, we're gonna run this. Or I, pull, I think he threatened to pull the whole show if, if it's some of his favorite cultural commentary pieces didn't get on. I don't know, but Archie. I don't, came up, some of you gay, I can't remember, and then uh, the big, uh, oh, I guess I can tell you, the clincher at the very end is Archie sitting at, down at Kelso's, Kelsey's bar, and he's talking to this big old studly former professional football player that he, he met as a cab driver or something. They've kind of become friends a little bit, and uh, Archie's relating to him all this whole thing about the, the fruits. I think that's what she calls them, the fruits. <laughs> uh, there's, there's some uh, pejoratives that aren't that offensive. I don't. I don't like to. You know. I like to walk. I like to walk, walk very carefully around that. But the fruits. That's just kind of a funny one. The fruits. <laughs> the fruits. The. Uh, the Garys without the R. <laughs> that was Ellen's mother. Remember that. <laughs> but, uh, Ellen. That was a good show, man. Her first sitcom. Is that still out there, Ellen? <laughs> Her mom. I don't think her real mom did this. Her real mom was cool. I think she might, she might, she might have died. Ellen used to have her on the show a lot. Ellen, God, did they slaughter her? That was tragic. You know that was distorted. Come on. They love to put. They're going after Patrick Mahomes now. I'm not. I'm not touching it. Don't read it. Stop reading it. They're just putting it out there. They're trying to make him sound like he beat up some horses or something. It's all distorted. I'm sure. God, I hate this bullshit. The media does this. All I saw was a headline. I said, oh, fuck, here they go. The big, you know, true hero. They're going to they're gonna bring him down because it gets, it gets eyeballs. It gets ratings. God, that pissed me off. Same thing with Ellen. Same thing. I'm not sure about the, the Oscars incident. That, I, I do think that's some bad behavior that, uh, that Will Smith will have to pay a severe price for. I think he's a great guy probably, but... What happened to his, what happened to his maturity? God, that was a pretty inexplicable. I don't have strong feelings about it. I just, uh, I was, I was in the same building with someone that was watching it live. I, I didn't believe him. I saw, I saw, oh, I saw a big gag. Chris Rock's a, Chris Rock's a netball. It wasn't, man. I watched it. They had, they had the footage up, like seconds later. Oh God, that was real. God, that was intense. So. You know, we're not going to put him in jail. You know, he's got to, I don't know, leave the academy for 10 years and go go sit on a mountain and do meditation and find out, you know, he's, something's going on within him. He should, he, should, he should have let that, not should have, I wanted him to just let that roll off. It was comedy. Come on. Come on, Will. What's going on? Something's going on between him and Jada. You can tell. She, I think she's, she might be, she might be, uh, she might be, 
running the show too much. You know, he's, he's a man. Men need to feel like they're kind of running the show sometimes in a marriage. Not always. I don't know how it works in a gay couple. I think somebody has more of a deep need to feel like they're the leader, you know? I don't know if they're always. I'm not, I'm not in a relationship. I don't know. But I sure, I think my heart aspires to lead my fair maiden. You know, she's more vulnerable than me. She's a lady. She's got lady parts. She's got the predations of men to put up with. I'm a freaking... Six foot five, 250 pound warrior. I want to protect my maiden and my family and my loved ones and my community. I want to start carrying a gun. I really do. I'm not even a big gun guy, but God dang. I want people to know I mean business. You start fucking with somebody I love. You, you start attacking, assaulting anybody. I might just blast a hole in your chest. Or I probably wouldn't have to do that. If you had a gun, I might. I don't know. These scenarios are incredibly unlikely to happen. I don't spend much time thinking about them, but it's the energy. That male protective energy is important. Men want to be heroes. We desperately need to feel like heroes. And, and you ladies are treasures, and you need to feel treasured, that we deeply treasure you, and we do. Once, once you men get clean on your hearts, you ladies get clean on your hearts, you'll find that sweet, exquisite, dynamic between men and women. I just feel it. You know, feminists can say whatever they want. I'd probably just disagree with them, you know. I got, ladies, you want to go out and be president? Do it, do it. But I have a hunch there's a quiet part of your heart that wants a family too, so that's real tough to pull off. A family and being a CEO, running a, a big operation. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go. Oh, wait, that for Lincoln. That's where I want to go. <laughs> that's a big operation. Mark McEver down there and his whole team. Barb's, Barb's not too involved in it. She, <laughs> she's got her own stuff going on. That is a hell of an operation. I bought, I bought Skippy down there. My sales specialist was Bob Myers. Good guy. I went by and saw him today. You know what I didn't have on Skippy? Uh, and I got, I got it straight about the way before Ford Lincoln. It, it didn't start in the 40s. It started in 1974 by uh, Maddox and Bradley. Okay, that's my understanding. I, I don't remember everybody's name. I went over on the sales floor where I bought the car from Bob Myers. And uh, I was talking to guys about, you know, where, where, when to start. And I know Mark, Mark and his partner bought it from Maddox and Bradley. And then Mark's, Mark's partner decided to... Uh, to retire, he wants he wants to get out of the business, go live on an island or something. <laughs> I don't know what he wants to do. I better not say people's names, but uh, Mark, too bad. I've already brought you. You're part of my life. You too, Barb. You're already in here. Uh, so now Mark's bringing his family into it. Barb, did not, Barb, not want no part of it. But his son, his son Jay, his, his name starts with a J, and his daughter T starts with a T. They're getting into the business, so it's going to become a family, family affair. There's all kinds of grandchildren, and uh, it's Mark needs to slow down. He needs to start turning some of this over to his boy. God dang, he's he's at least my age. He might be one year older than me. We all went, we all lived, we all grew up in the same era. Barb was out in Bonner Springs. Mark McEver was in uh, the Lathe Eyes in Overland Park. <laughs> I got to talking to Mark. I had a crush from third grade until, till uh, tenth grade, till my sophomore year. I had a crush on Dee Dee Lindemeyer. I don't know why. My friend Ted, he he thought she was so cute in third grade. I didn't even know about girls. I said, "Oh God, Ted Ted likes her. I better like her too." <laughs> I didn't know why. <laughs> there was something though. There was something. I might have to. <laughs> I'm gonna take this shirt off. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go crank it up a little more. Jeez, try to turn the fan up a little more. I'll keep talking to you. All right. uh, so anyway, Ted. Ted likes Deanna Lindemeyer, and I decided I liked her too. That's right, Deanna. 
Everybody called her Dee Dee. I didn't like Dee Dee. I like Deanna. 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 I called her. Everybody else they called her Dee Dee. I didn't like that for some reason. Because it was, well, it's, it, it started in, it's like she, she decided she's going to be fancy. Kind of like the boys started using the last names, you know, started being Hass and McEver and Croucher and the girls, the girls started coming up with nicknames. Deanna decides she's going to be Dee Dee. I, I bet her family maybe called her that or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> like, uh, geez. 45 years later, Mark and I were chatting about something. And he says, you know, he kept talking about cruising the Fay. <laughs> that's, that's what they did out here in Olathe back, back in the late 70s. That's when, that's when he and I would have been teenagers and stuff. Uh, cruising the Fay, the, the main drag through through a lake that's called Santa Fe Street. And uh, cruising the Fay is what you did on Fridays and Saturday nights, I guess. And uh, we didn't really have the equivalent of that in Overland Park, maybe a little bit on Metcalf. I think we cruised Metcalf, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't a very hip, <laughs> hip uh, teenager. I sort of, I don't know what I was. <laughs> I wasn't nothing. I, just, uh, I didn't have a crowd. I didn't, I didn't have a crowd. I was, I was a lone wolf. Yeah, I hung out by myself. I had, well, I had, I had a few friends, not super close friends, that I felt dependent on, though. I didn't like dependency on anyone. I wanted to feel, I wanted to feel individualistic and not, it bothered me when people were needy of their families and stuff. And now I understand, look at that's, looking back now, I understand why, because I, I needed that and I didn't have that. No, I, I, I was jealous, I was envious. My friend Bob, he, he was close with his, with his parents and his, sisters or he got a lot of he felt a lot of support from them and his church and I thought I was critical of that I said yeah he's weak he's weak he didn't know uh, we're human beings we need that now I know why that's critical because I was envious anytime you have a negative feeling towards someone oftentimes it's a signal it's a very very cool system so something and somebody tweaks you somebody feels somebody talks too much and it bothers you or it irrit overly irritates you and you can't giggle about it. Pay attention, it might be indicating something you don't like about yourself, maybe. So maybe you talk a little too much or aren't a good listener or something that irritates you about another person. That's oftentimes a super good mirror. Oh, you know, what? what's that old thing? Oh, you know, you're pointing at them. You, you, you. There's a, <laughs> no, no, what you're saying is, oh, you, 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 oh. If somebody, some, some quality in a person arouses you, pay attention. Very likely, it's part of your self-development program. <laughs> so, oh, wait to forward Lincoln. Good buying experience. I had never purchased a car from a car dealer. My dad liked private party transactions. Oh, well, he, he did all the new cars when he was younger, and then he, he liked the depreciation to be absorbed by somebody else. You know, they're always talking about the first couple of years, and boom, it just falls off a cliff. And then the car kind of retains its value and slowly diminishes after those first couple of years. So he, he, he tried to get two, three-year-old cars, but uh, he came to find that uh, the dealers have all the good cars. <laughs> he couldn't find any cars, so he had to deal with the dealers. And he didn't like it. He didn't like it haggling as he called it he doesn't he like play, playing that game i understand why i don't like haggling it's it it can be fun but i don't know i don't think i'm that good at it <laughs> i would i don't think i'd be a good poker player i don't know it's kind of like poker you know make the other guy say his number first i, I just intuitively know certain things in negotiation and i know win-win is good that's a very, you know, Getting to Yes was a very famous negotiation book that I read long ago. And it's all about, you know, it's all about clarity of communication, really, and, and getting clear on what's important to you in this deal, you know. Both parties getting super clear and finding out if there's amenability between what each party needs and, and what each party is willing to offer and, and give up or give. So learn, learn how to compromise. God, that's important. Compromise. I, I hear this about marriage. <laughs> marriage is all about compromise, I hear. Oh, a few people have said that, huh? <laughs> so, 
Yeah, the one, the one I like, the one I remember is like, you know, an issue comes up. Find out how important this is, the restaurant we go to. Is this a screaming ten of importance for you? And, or is it, you know, is it, I don't really care, but, you know. I was married for a short time to Christina. Well, we, we were a couple for seven or eight years. She was my Baywatch bunny. <laughs> God, she was beautiful. She's a little biracial beauty from Banning, California. It's out in the desert somewhere, and she did, she had a rough upbringing. She, uh, her mother was a piece of cake, a piece of work. <laughs> I, I loved her mother, but her mother has a few problems. <laughs> had a few too many babies with too many, too many different men, and Christina happened to be one of those babies with with uh, uh, Don. Uh, what well, God? Her her dad was so cool. God, her dad was, Christina's dad, I can't think of his name. He's passed now, but, uh, not Don, what is it? Dan, Dan. God, Dan was cool. A lot of character in that man. I don't know, I don't know how Christina's mom ended up with him somehow. She, I don't know, Christina's mom had a lot of, a lot of kids. Christina was one of them. I don't think she has any full, she has a bunch of half-siblings. Christina's out in Australia with Jenny. Jenny, say hi to Christina. She, Christina Morrison, she's down there somewhere. She's married to some Aussie guy. Jenny, Jenny Devaney's down there. Uh, why are y'all going to Australia? She became an Australian citizen. What's going on? No matter where you go, there you are, Chrissy. You can't run away from yourself. <laughs> no, I love her. She's 10 years younger than me. 10 years. Yeah. She was good when her... Uh, her previous boyfriend. I liked him, Tim. Tim was a flat, he was the flat guy for Barry Deller. He was the one that would uh, be on Barry Deller's private jet, serving him, serving him lunch and dinner and taking care of his baggage and all that. Barry Deller's a big shot. And then, then he got on the Spielberg's plane. Good God. Hope you're doing well, Tim. He started being a flight attendant for uh, for Steven Spielberg, can you imagine? You want that kind of job? You want to know what that feels like? So set, your, set your ticker to it. You know what he started doing? Tim was pumping gas station out at Santa Monica Airport because he loved airplanes. That's how he got into this. So, if you want to be, I wanted to be on a movie set badly. I, I went and did it. Boom! Look, 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 look how things happen. If you take a risk, just go do what you need to do. If you want to be on a movie set, sign up to be an extra. I don't know how that works now. Back then, you. Sometimes it was only 40 bucks. They give you 40 bucks and a lunch and a, and a snack and for, you know, 12, well, was, there was overtime. So usually it'd be 12 hour days, 12 hour day. I think you made 60 bucks and they take your taxes and all that. But you know, God, I got on moon, I told you I got on moonlighting and uh, I got on that cult movie, They Live. Uh, you can spot me in there. I got on coach a whole bunch of times with uh, Craig, Craig Nelson, Craig, Craig T. T. Nelson. I was one of the football players, and you know we'd give it our uh, pep talks and everything, and we'd all I'd be one of the players because I'm a big guy. Fogger Rocky, God, he was funny. He's a good guy, man. He's very personable, very down to earth. He chatted me up. I was so intimidated on these sets, you know. The those people were like gods or something. If you were in front of the camera, I just had this weird, weird reverence for you or something. All the oh, even day players, everybody, weird. I think I lost that. Hoff, man, if I ran into Hoff, yeah, I'm still running. I, w I, I wouldn't be starstruck. I don't think, maybe for five seconds, but I don't know. I mean, all that accumulated time with him, I was not intimidated around him at work, but I, I had an awareness that I wanted to be very careful that I didn't try to exploit Hoff. You know what I'm saying? that I didn't try to utilize the juicy little job I had for, for personal advantages of any kind. So I just really watched myself and, and same with everybody. I didn't, didn't want to, and so it's very fuzzy to me what, what that would look like even, but I knew I, knew I didn't want to approach it. So I just kind of stayed a little distant maybe to make sure I never crossed that boundary of, of exploitation or something. So I feel good about that. Oh, ah.
We're gonna test. Uh -uh. We haven't even started yet. We got two, two ready to go. And how much? Time? Oh, got thirty minutes. <laughs> well, look at there. Zero, zero. All right. Let's go to work. <laughs> It's something new. I don't know what these are. They taste good. It's not beer, but what is that called? Saturday, Natterday, Natterdays. They're better tasty. They do. They taste like strawberry lemonade. It's like strawberry lemonade, but I guess there's beer in there. Oh God. Oh, I need that. Mm. So, all right, I, I hope I can go an hour. AC's kicking off. You get hot, you get hot. These studio lights are beaming down. You know, real studio lights are hot. They get these arc lamps. They, uh, they take incredible amperages of electricity and, and short them out, basically, and create an arc light. And that's how, uh, you know, that's how the welding used to be done. That's how movie projectors used to run. To get the bright light they needed, they used to they used to use an arc to uh, to do film projection. Yeah, sets sets could be stiflingly hot, especially location shoots. And and you know California's wonderful, but you get inside a building on a real location, and we did a lot of that. At, and at the studio, get on a studio set a lot. You've probably been to Universal or something and seen. It's really only half a building or. You know what's really fun? I did a lot of this. I went to see uh, tapings or, or uh, broad, uh, the live tapings of, of sitcoms. It's uh, Charles in Charge. Uh, I went and saw a bunch of them. I can't remember all of them. Oh, I went and did The Price is Right so many times. I was determined to get on that show. <laughs> you stand in that line and the, the producers, you know, you're outside CBS Television City and... Uh, you stand in this big long line, and, and uh, I can't remember how the tickets work. It's not that hard to get in, and studios, it's, it's much smaller than it appears on TV. I think it holds 150 people or something, and uh, the pro producers have done this so many times. They just say, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? That, that, that's about it. That's your interview right there, and uh, it all hinges. You know, a lot of it hinges just on if you got a military uniform or you know, study the study the people that are on prize. It's a lot of women because women are more excitable and more interesting, or old people or young, crazy girls. It's hard hard to ever dudes like me that are middle middle you know just kind of boring middle class guys. It's usually some someone with a little more flavor and flair. A lot of a lot of minorities get on there. No, I know I don't want to get in a fight about anything. A lot of uh, just people with a little flavor. You know, maybe big accent. It's good for ratings. There's nothing wrong with that. So that, that's really what the producers of Price is Right are looking for. It's probably not going to have any, do anything to do with how, how you answer that question. Could say something really stupid. You know, hey, how, how, how are you? Where are you from? I don't know who I am. I think I'm from Mars. I don't know. Say something goofball. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll like you. They just got to like you. They might, they might come on down. Can't believe how long that show's been. That's good. Go to tapings. And go, to, go to sitcom cafes. If you're going out to, I don't know if they still have all the, if, you know, has, have, I don't know if stuff's still happening in Los Angeles. I assume it is, but that, that industry has changed so much. Things are filmed all over the world, but I still think it's a hub of, you know, like, aren't there still sitcoms? And I don't even know this TV scene right now. i got to get updated on that. But I keep wanting to talk about Alexa Ford. Lincoln, Bob Myers, he sold me Skippy. This car is a 2011, but... Had 45,000 miles on it. Guess how that mileage was accrued? A retired couple with a Class A motorhome towed it, towed Skippy with no motor running on a tow bar with his wheels racking up mileage. Most of that mileage is Skippy being towed behind a big old Class A motorhome with a tow bar. 
45,000 miles they drove around the United States. He, he barely even had his motors turned on, so. He's a new car, really. New car. I don't quibble with price. Mark, what do you, what do you want? He, he knocks he knocks them on him. Don't quibble on price with, I don't know. A, a, it depends on the dealership. So it's some, sometimes that's expected. It's just part of the game, probably, but I don't, I don't, sometimes I like quibbling when I, I don't know, but, uh-oh, what was that? I don't know. Ah! I don't know. Everything appears to be normal. Stop, oh, I'm still going. Oh, so, Bob sold me Skippy. We went out for a test. It's a hot day. I think it was, it was March, but it was real hot, and the AC worked good, and I, I, I said, Bob, I'm going to drive it hard. We, we got out on the freeway, and boom, man, he roared, and we went down an exit and then roared back. I, I love him. I want him. I'm going to pay cash. I've been saving th three years for this. I'll give you a $10,000 check. He's, whoa, whoa, slow down. <laughs> we got we to gotta, we gotta give you a lot of paperwork, and we got to figure out insurance. You know, we're going we're gonna to help you with insurance. So Mark, Mark McGever got me set up with his insurance guy, and I got a pretty rough record. I got a, I got a great rate, and... I did not want to finance anything. I just, you know, my parents always just paid cash. That way you don't have to carry the comprehensive and collision. Cut your insurance bill in half at least. And I, I got two DUIs, so. My liability only is, it would have been 400. Mark, that's a pretty good rate for a two DUI guy. It would have been 400 or every six months. That's pretty good. On Kansas, it's pretty cheap. That, that's probably pretty shocking numbers for people in different parts of the world or different parts of the U.S. Well, 400 for six months for a double DUI guy it seems incredibly low. That's, what's that, 75 a month? Something keeps bleep, bleeping on me. I don't know, doesn't matter. But, McEver, he said, dude, your, your credit's a mess, you know. <laughs> he, they, they, look, they look for the financing. I didn't want any, but I think, you know, they, they he, his idea was, you know, take out a little load, take out, Take out a $2,000 note uh, against Skippy. We can rehabilitate your credit, because credit could be, you know, mine's crap. I've, I've destroyed it through, through abuse and misuse and inattention and, and just plain recklessness and carelessness. It's, it's destroyed. I've had a bankruptcy, so I won't talk about that now. Uh, I said, yeah, good idea. But it did require me to carry uh, comprehensive and collision insurance. That turned my payment into $850 of car insurance every six months. I said, Mark, I don't like that. He said, I know, I know. I hear you, but he said, pay that note for a year. It was a two-year note. You know, $2,000 over two years is $93 a month I pay. I'm going to pay that for a year. Mark said, pay it for a year. That will accomplish the majority of what it's meant to accomplish, which is to prove that you're good credit risk. Main Street Credit Union loaned me $2,000. And there's fees and stuff, who cares? They gotta make their money, you know? That was my, my dad didn't like the junk fees he called them the car dealers. I don't begrudge them that, man. They gotta, you know, they, 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 they throw in a, they throw in a fee over there for all the stuff that has to be done, but there's a lot to be done. So don't, don't begrudge them junk fees. I thought my dad was a little too, I don't know. He just, he went in, he didn't like that, you know, cars had 10,000 by the time he walked out of there, it, you know, it turned into 11,700, I don't know. But there's all, you know, the state's got sales tax. I think they got to collect that. That's like 8% or something. So boom, I, instantly Skippy was, was $800 more of sales tax. And then there was a, all, you know, all, all, who's doing that? <laughs> all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. Uh, Go see Bob. To sell you car, he uh, he. I needed a placard. A way to Ford Lincoln it was founded by Maddox and Bradley in '74. That's my understanding. Mark was watching cars for him out of high school. Mark Mark didn't go to uh, higher education. He went to FU. <laughs> I think that's what he calls it. Ford. A way to Ford University. O F U. That's what he calls it. <laughs> he has spent his whole life. From washing cars to guess who owns the dealership now? Guess uh, I'm not gonna get into numbers. That's crass. But his dealership isn't even his main business. He sells ambulance chassis. T 
to uh, ambulance makers all over the place. And that's, why, that's how this plays in this story. I was watching Deja Vu with uh, Denzel Washington, and there's a chase scene with, a, with an ambulance, and right, big head-on shot, right on the front license plate is Oatha Ford Lincoln. I said, oh, I about freaked out, because that film was shot down in, uh, in the south, like in, in the uh, New Orleans area, I think. And it's, a, it's a great movie. And there's a big old honking ambulance being chased by somebody. It's being driven by a bad guy, and uh, right in the front of that ambulance, I'll wait to Ford Lincoln. So I had to go down there and get me my placard today, and I talked to Bob, and I got my placard. Skippy loves it. It's kind of an iconic symbol. They kept it the same ever since the 70s. So, yeah, go talk to Bob. Get a Ford. Well, they got, they got, you know, that was part of their, uh, their, there are trade-ins and stuff. They got other cars at dealerships, but find a dealership. It's all about reputation for me. I mean, read read their Google reviews. You go look at Oasis oh, Ford's Lincoln. I've never seen such a screaming attentiveness to the customer on all the reviews that they get. They have somebody fully dedicated to to responding to their Google reviews. Their attentiveness to customer satisfaction is and it's not just you know that they really mean it because you know everybody one one comment out of 10 on google reviews is somebody's a little unhappy and they're they always say hey man please we, we didn't know we didn't know. call us we, we will make, we'll make it right we'll make it right and i know they will so far skippy's he's only done about 400 miles i know if there's a problem and of course i'm going to take it to maintenance that's where a lot of these guys survive is, is maintenance they don't make that much money on on the cars sometimes they really need that they really need your Loyalty and their maintenance. And it's probably a little pricier than, you know, I don't know, change your own oil, whatever. But eh, don't always be only about price. You know, be about loyalty and and rewarding the people that that operate ethically and with love and concern. And you know, reward. Let's reward the 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 ethical, passionate businessmen that that want to serve. You know, service is a beautiful thing. And, and that's how they make their living is doing service, and you know, you know, I I, I trust them. they're not gonna rip me off. They're you know whatever. They're not trying to rip me off. I could feel it if I was trying to be ripped off. It's pay attention to your feelings. I met a broker today. See, I want to buy some property. I don't have any money, but <laughs> I have a dream. I have a dream. I'm gonna let out right here. You know, I'm heavily involved in helping Barb with the homeless shelter from December 1st to March 31st every year. I was homeless about five years ago. I've been volunteering ever since with Barb, and that's how I've become so close with Barb, because I've spent so much time with her at the shelter. She started this thing with a, with a man named Dean Asklund, and Dean died, tragic, not tragically, but he, he was killed over on his bicycle, and it was his time to go, I guess. And this, this was about three or four years ago, and Dean and, every thought Dean and, uh, Barb were married because they spent so much time together working on Project 1020. They weren't. It was a, it was a it was a very close friendship and, and a beautiful work relationship. And I think Dean was a little bit in love with her. I saw I saw I saw them together. He had a he had a bit of a yearning in his eyes. But Mar Barb's a happily married woman, so stay away, guys. Stay away. <laughs> I adore Mark and Barb, and I help her on that. Well. I have a newly awakened dream, Project 1020. We're trying to get people housed, and you know how I want to do that? I want to replicate the Oxford House model. A lot of people are familiar with Oxford House. I, I've stated one Oxford House, maybe, yeah, one. I tried it out. I think I did six months. I, I, I think it's a wonderful model. It's for people that are struggling, struggling with substance abuse. and. Uh, it's all built around that. These are these are private homes, and they're leased out to an Oxford chapter. And it's usually eight guys, maybe ten, two to a bedroom usually will live there. And you cannot use drugs or alcohol while you're there. Um, a lot of guys find a stability there. I want to I want to replicate that with some slight differences, and start buying houses in Olathe and turn them into 
a 1020 house, 1020 house, and we start with the house next door, 211 East Cedar Street. Is it's going to go on the market in uh, three weeks. It's beautifully restored, 1916. Uh, I don't know. I don't know my architectural styles, but I've made friends with the the guy that's redoing it. His name's Toby, and uh, I've been over there bugging him and asking him what he wants and. I just I, I just threw a number at him out of thin air. I said, if I walk in here with, boom, this number. He said, yeah, I probably would. He said, I, I, I need about three weeks to finish up, and then I'm going to make up my mind about what I want for the house. Now, I want, I would buy that house in a second, but, and I have the, I, ha, I sort of have the money. See, I have a couple of trusts. My grandfather left me a trust. It's not even a million dollars, all right, but it's a big chunk. My mother left me a trust. It's not even a million dollars, but it's a chunk. That It's enough. I wanted to go down to the trustees of both of those trusts and say, hey, I don't like what you're doing with the with the investments in these two trusts. You're, you're way too safe. I want this money invested in Olathe housing. I want you to buy 211 East Cedar. I, w I better not talk numbers here. I want you to buy it with the principal from one of these, and the trust will own it. I will rent it from the trust. You get it? So the trust will have a very sweet asset that's gonna skyrocket in appreciation. The next 10 years, that house will easily double in price. I know it will. I know what's happening in this neighborhood. I live in this neighborhood. Well, that has evolved. I approached Barb, I said, I didn't really approach her. I, <laughs> I, I threw it at her. I didn't do it very skillfully, I said, Barb, uh, the Project 1020 Land Trust is going to buy, I was a little too bossy, <laughs> is going to buy 211 East Cedar, Barb. I did all this in a in a text. I probably should have done it in person more gently. <laughs> yeah, things did not go well, but it's not over yet. <laughs> so, my dream his dream project 1020 would buy that house beautiful house four bedroom house I already have the homeless guys picked out that I want to live with me over there I would be the house captain I've been homeless I think I think a house needs a captain the the Brad uh, the Oxford houses have have uh, presidents and vice presidents we, we'd have something similar probably I, there's, a, there's a lot I won't, I won't talk about too many details, but Barb takes pride in her shelter being what's called low barrier. Because sometimes you go to a shelter and they want ID. Are you kidding me? ID? I'm homeless. Why am I homeless? My wallet got stolen. Well, what, what's in your, my ID's in my wallet? Of course I don't have any ID. That's part of why it's a big reason I can't get anything done in this world. Yeah, that's like a... It's like being able to breathe, having a... Having a piece of government uh, identification. You can't get anything done. A, a huge part of Barb's mission work is is helping people get their ID so they can start getting their lives in order. Now, homelessness is not, it's a multifaceted thing. It's not all substance abuse and, and mental illness. There's, there's all kinds of variables to it. There's, that's often a component, but don't oversimplify things, all right? You can, there's, there's gradations. I mean, I, I'm considered mentally ill because I have I've had lifelong depression and I I think I've finally been convinced that I have a very low end case of bipolar they call it uh, the problem I had is that they, they, they only had like two types of bipolar you know like the super severe kind and then the the kind that's a little more controllable and I think I think I have like super controllable kind because I do who cares if I have that? Why, why do we have to have a name for it? I'll tell you why. Because the insurance companies. If you can't put a formal, diagnosable name on your emotional health ailment, then the insurance company won't pay for your therapy. That's, that's the whole game right there. So, I, I don't even use that word anymore, mental health. We all have emotional health challenges. God, we all want to feel good, and it's a struggle knowing how do I feel good and, and live a meaningful, happy, purposeful life satisfying existence that's a that's not a mental health problem that's a life challenge come on 
Stop medicalizing everything. It's hard getting out of bed some morning. So we do, we do it anyway because people dependent on us, all right? It's not, a mental, it's not an emotional health problem. It's a, cha- it's a life challenge. It's life is tough. Life is difficult. Once we embrace and accept that life is challenging, everything gets so much easier. We stop whining. What, who told you you're entitled to something easy? Oh, God, how boring would that be if everything was easy? You think anybody's had it easy? You guys got these fantasies, all the rich people, they got it easy. Oh, but you want to bet? They commit suicide just as much as everybody else. No. Every thinks the money will help? No. Nah. It does for a few months. And then you get used to it. Anything. You win the lottery, your life is ruined. If you win the lottery, uh, go watch all the documentaries. About half the people are miserable and bankrupt and broke five years later. Some of them are dead. None of them have any, all their friends are gone. Uh, they're unhappy. Yeah, winning the lottery ain't all it's cracked up to be if you go and study people who have won the lottery. All right, so stop fantasizing that money's going to fix it. No. You know it'll fix it? You get real. You get truthful. So, my truth right now is buying houses in Olathe, Kansas. I went driving the neighborhood that I love down here where I live. It's called Original Old Town, Olathe. It's a charming mixture of old stuff. There's been teardowns and new stuff. There's a few newer McMansions. There's some Victorian. God, it's a blend of everything. My vision, my goal is for Project 1020 Land Trust to start acquiring Olathe properties. The city of Olathe screwed us over bad. Project 1020, and we're going to take vengeance on them. I want Project 1020 to start buying properties, and this is even funnier. There's an elegant old mansion named Oxford Walnut House that has just gone up for sale. It's got 10 Oxford House guys living in it, and the house has gone on the market. I told Barbara about it. I've been over there coincidentally to have a Thanksgiving dinner with another drunk friend of mine and met all the drunks that live because <laughs> I you know I go to meetings and things that point. I still go to a few meetings I, that, that works they work you know I got nothing against that it's just not my full-time model uh, that's for sale Walnut Oxford Walnut is for sale who cares about price all these houses are going to be doubling in value because of what's happening in downtown Olathe they have just built an almost $300 million brand new county courthouse. Uh, they've just built a 240 unit, fairly high end condo complex right in the heart of downtown. They got three, the, the rents are incredibly uh, pricey for this area. 1800 for a three bedroom to, to 12 or 1300 for a studio. That's like unheard of. I have my little place here, 500 for, for uh, First three years, and now it's, it's she's had to put it up to 650. But you know, it's a little one bedroom. It's I don't know 800 square feet or something. 650, that's considered a pretty normal kind of price down here in Olathe. All my neighbors are you know houses around here are selling. I don't know they had been selling for like 150, 200, but that's got to change quick. Like the one next door, he just bought it. He got it. He's pouring a couple hundred grand into it to gut it. He moved out of it. He's living in an apartment. Everybody's going to do that to these houses down here. They're going to double in value. The one next door, I think it should go for, I think it should go for 350. I think it, I think it'll easily be worth 600. And, the, and Project 1020 would be the beneficiary of all that appreciation. So Barb, come on now, let's do this. I met Croucher, Brady Croucher, just driving around. He's a broker. Croucher, real estate. I got to get to know him better. He saw my David Hasselhoff support group stickers. He graduated from Olathe South in 2006. Good guy. I could see it in his eyes. God, handsome. Nice, nice full beard. He had just bought a little, kind of a little beater house as an investment that he's going to own and, and rent out. So he's, he's, a, he's in this game. He might be my competitor. So I, no, I talked to him. And he said, no, nah, I'm not buying no more. I don't, I don't got any more money. This is my last one. So he's going to help me keep my sniffer up about properties going up for sale in the in the uh, heart of downtown Olathe. Or just in this, it's kind of a, I haven't demarcated exactly the area. I kind of felt the areas that really interest me the most. And there's, there's a blend of neighborhoods and everything. But I got to write, I might just send this to Barb. Barb, 
talking to you. This is the 1020 house model. Be very similar. Yeah, I'm talking to Barb. Very similar to the Oxford model, but the 1020 model would be even more low barrier. I don't think we'd be so so intolerant of drinking because that's legal. Uh, that would have to, that's a touchy area, of course. I, I don't think we could be tolerant of, of anything illegal. We would really have to be ethical. Um, but there's a few areas where I think Oxford is a little too dogmatic. And I think a low barrier Project 1020 house with a, with a house captain, someone like me, and not so many guys. Five, ten, eight and ten is too many guys. We need houses. People need, guys need families. We need houses of, of four or five, six guys with a house captain. And they would be Project 1020 houses. And I, and I believe they should be segregated with men and women. I don't know. I don't think we would do children. I think we've got to stay with the adults. Um, I'm thinking out loud here, Barb. So Project 1020 house, Awaitha is going to explode. you got some investment money to work with, I feel. Now, I might because, see, this may become my deal. If you don't get on board... My lawsuit against the Commerce Trust is going to be huge. I can feel it because they haven't, they have not called me back. They will not respond to any questions I have about the other two trusts. See, I have a third trust from my father that I got screwed out of at the end of his life when he had dementia. My, uh, a very, very evil outside party came in, a, uh, a uh, caretaker. And maneuvered their way into my father's heart, my son's heart, and my father's pocketbook. And I got written out of my father's trust. My father had a lot of money. I was, my father intended half of that money to, to go to me, and it was all taken away from me. I still got 60% of my mother's money, and I got, uh, I got whatever was left over of my grandfather's money. So I'm, I'm okay, I get a nice income, but my father wanted me to have half of the several million dollars that he busted his ass for and uh, nope he had he had dementia he wrote me out because he didn't know what was going on he thought I was the bad guy they uh, they kept him away from me I could not be with my dad at the end of his life he's a lovely man god dang he's fun he's fu god he's fucking nice love you dad alright so I got screwed I'm going I'm going after Commerce Trust with full guns blazing. I sent I sent them a threat letter. Probably made them pee their pants because they haven't they haven't been responding to my inquiries for over ten days now. I'm gonna, I'm spending the rest of my life going after them. They uh, they really did me wrong, and they need to pay. They're gonna pay some big damages to me. So I may be buying all the property, Barb. They're gonna be paying me big 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 settlement on the hardships I went through. After I got written out of Dad's trust, you know the hardships I went through over the last seven years ago. I got written out, I got written out of my Dad's trust, half of it. The other half was going to Mark. Now he got he got all of it, and he's miserable. Of course he's miserable, buying cars and being stupid. All his friends, he can't trust anybody. He got all this money, he doesn't know what to do with it. He's got it in the market, and he's staring at it every day. He's he's a mess. But I love him. We'll get him fixed up, and Commerce is going to make, make things right with me. It's going to take years, Barb. It's going to take a few years for me to get that money. If you don't buy them, I want them to be 10, 20 houses. They're going to be half houses. You know that. If I do this, it's going to be the same model, but uh, you lose the naming rights. I, I get the rights if I buy them. They're going to be half house because I love half. I love 10, 20, but I love half more. All right. I love you guys. This is, this is like pure therapy for me. I feel the ability to think out loud. It's like having a good, you guys are my good friends. I feel like you care about me. I know you care about me. I get to, you know, I'm on the verge of tearing up right now. So much stuff comes up. I trust you. I wouldn't be afraid to cry in front of you. Uh, tears are so healthy. Tears are so healthy. I love you guys. I'm going to throw this. These take a long time to load. These take three hours to load. They're... The frame rate must be intense. Anyway, that's the, you guys, if the universe is meant to, to have 1020 housing, 
I want 10, 10, 20 houses or 10 hoff houses with, with, with homeless people in them. We're going to get these homeless people off the streets in Olathe because Olathe screwed us over bad. We're going to do it right in their noses, okay? 10. We need 10 Olathe, 10, 20 houses this year. And we need team captains. And they're going to have homeless people living there, all right? Love you guys. Good night.